The second lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. Listen for God's word to you. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. The word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the words we heard read today from your holy book. And now as we listen to these words which come from my lips, I most humbly pray that you would pour through me the gift of preaching, that they would remain no longer simply my words, but instead would be transformed into your living word to each and every person who hears them, that they might be met in exactly their place of need. We pray this, Lord, in great anticipation and in the strong name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. It has been a stressful week right up until this very moment. <laughs> so <laughs> we started out in the aftermath of an assassination attempt leading into the Republican National Convention and all of the anxiety that that produced as our nation continues to be divided and challenged. And then we've got the weather the weather, which is really gorgeous right now, and I don't know about you, but I am loving it. However, the front page of the Democrat and Chronicle yesterday announced that we have had 16 tornadoes in the month of July. A record number of, of events, and they're not probably done yet, of weather events. So, so here we are in the midst of, of a season that, that we want to proclaim is beautiful. This is, after all, the time to live in Rochester. And yet, there's an underlayer of anxiety about what's coming next. What does that all mean? And then, of course, on Friday, there was a global technological outage that affected members of my staff as they were trying to get out of town to go on vacation and could not go and affected me personally as I am the convener of the Executive Presbyter Nominating Committee and we're bringing our candidate in to meet with members of the Presbytery and of course his plane couldn't get out and he had to drive nine and a half hours from Kentucky and I had to do all of the work to make sure that that message got out about cancellations and what is happening and what's not. And then we come in this morning and have the additional stressor of not having our organist be here and deep concern about what may have happened to him. It is just... What a beautiful moment to be in the house of the Lord, right? I mean, and I, 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 I feel like even if you're not sitting with us in this space, even if you're online, to just be looking at this space and take a holy moment where you are, I, I feel like I really want to start with an acknowledgement of the calming presence of God 
in the midst of all the stress that is not just out in the world, but is also in our own personal lives. So let's just take a breath. Take a moment to be present in the Lord's house. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. And that is a theme that runs through both of our scripture lessons, even if you don't necessarily see it in the second one. In the first one, we've got David, who has been anointed king. He has determined that Jerusalem is going to be the center of his kingdom, the seat of power. He has brought the Ark of the Covenant up the hill to what is now known as the Temple Mount, and it is sitting there in a temporary structure. And he thinks to himself... Gee, wouldn't it be nice if that structure were not temporary but permanent? And he expresses this to Nathan, who is the head prophet in his time, who is sort of his, his chief of staff, his head advisor. And he says, you know what? I'm living in this beautiful house, and the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord is essentially living in a tent. I want to build a sanctuary. And that sounds like a great plan, right? That's exactly what Nathan says. Nathan, Nathan says, wow, I think that's going to be fabulous. Let's do it. And then he goes away and the word of the Lord comes to him and says, you go tell David that that is not my plan at all. It is not his to build my house. I didn't ask for it, did I? Did you hear me asking for it? Tell him no. Tell him that instead, I will make him a house. That there will come a time when a, when a temple is built, but it is not now. And I think that we see this pattern of discerning and building, discerning and building has gone on throughout history as we ponder what it is to be a people of faith. That there are times when we are in a process of discernment in sort of a, a, a liminal space, an in-between place, and then there are times of building. And then there come a time of discernment and a time of building. And we've been in this time of discernment as a church right now, and we're leaning into, stepping into a time of of building, as we see with these ordinations coming up, as we see with this impending capital campaign, as we see with the growth and development of all levels of spirituality here in the congregation, we've been in this time of discernment and we are moving into a time of building. We see this as well in our second scripture lesson, this, this theme of discernment and building in the second lesson. The second lesson, you may have noticed, is kind of odd. It gives us verses 30 to 34 and then verses 53 to 56. And it, it kind of feels like, I don't know, a lot happens, but not a lot happens. It's more like it's sort of slice of life scripture. And so, of course, as always, when I look at scripture lessons, I go, well, what happened in between? And I go and I look, and what happens in between is the feeding of the 5,000, and then Jesus tells the disciples to go and take the boat on ahead. He's going to go rest for a while. A big storm comes up, and he walks on water and calms the storm. And then we have the second lesson. So what happens between these sort of slice-of-life lessons are two miracles. And you kind of wonder, why are we not reading about the miracles? Why are we reading about the slice-of-life stuff? Why are we reading about the just sort of what Jesus' day-to-day -day business is? It's as if we got up here and read, well, you know, and then I went to the grocery store, and I saw my friend Sam, and we chatted about what's happening on the weekend, and we, why are we reading this rather than reading about the graduations or the celebrations. And, and in reality, that's how we live our lives, isn't it? We tell people about the big things that are going on in our lives, and we very rarely talk about, at least to the general public, 
about sort of just the day-to-day -day activities. And yet these are the day-to-day -day activities. This is the time of discernment before the building, before the miracles. This is the in-between stuff. And I think in looking at these passages, we come to recognize that it is the in-between stuff that matters. It is the in-between stuff that makes those big celebrations the big celebrations. It's the in-between stuff, the way we live our lives just in the day-to-day, -day, what we call right now ordinary time, that enables the big things to happen. So the apostles, word here is apostoloi, which means the ones who are sent out. They're not being called the disciples here because Jesus has literally sent them out. They've been sent out to go two by two and do his work. So it's sort of a, 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 a preliminary practice session before he goes on to his death and resurrection. Now they don't know that, but that's what he's done. He sent them out and now they've come back. And they are named apostles, apostoloi. This is the first time that Mark does this. And they come to Jesus, and Jesus says, Phew, good work. Let's go rest. Let's go take some time in a deserted place. Now, the words here are aramon topon. Topon, you might recognize the Greek root for topography. That is the word that's place. And a ramon that is, here is deserted. It's sort of isolated wilderness. So they are going to go to a, an isolated wilderness space. They're going to go someplace, you know, where they can be in the spa and get their nails done. And they get in the boat, and they begin to travel across the water. We're told again to a deserted place, so we are doubly told that we are going to a deserted place, a wilderness space, a liminal place, and they go, and there are people who recognize them, who see them. The word here is actually, the root word is nosos, gnosis, which means to know. They don't just see them and go, ah, huh, I think I know who that is. They know who that is. They know that is Jesus coming, and they know that they want to be there. And so as the boat is coming closer to the shore in this wilderness place, in this isolated space, they begin to see sort of little dots coming toward the shore. And as they get closer to the shore, those, those dots resolve into human beings, and human beings bringing their sick, their hurt, their problems all coming to the shore. And by the time they get to the shore and Jesus gets out of the boat and steps on to the sands of it, the place is packed. So this deserted place, this place of isolation and wilderness is now filled with people, filled, if you will, with problems, with needs, with challenges. And Jesus looks out and sees them, and he doesn't say, go away, you guys. We're taking a moment to rest here. The scripture tells us he looks on them with compassion because they are like a sheep without a shepherd. And I think this tells us, even today, that sometimes... When we're in the wilderness, we're in the desert, we're in that liminal space, that in-between place, that place of discernment, there is still work to be done. In July, June, June 28th of 1969, there was a police raid on the Stonewall Bar in New York City, in the Greenwich Village area. And for the first time ever, the people in that bar rose up against the raid. And it sparked this uprising, which has come to be known as, this, as the Stonewall Uprising, sparked a revolution. It sparked a movement. It sparked across the country what came to be known as the Gay Liberation Movement. 
And here in Rochester, five and a half, six hours from New York City, there was also a rising tide that got sparked as a result of what happened in New York City. And the next year, there was a commemorative, parade, uh, commemorative picnic. The following year, there was a commemorative march. And that march turned into the parade that we know today, the parade that is this incredible, jubilant celebration of all human beings, LGBTQIA people, all created children of God just as they are. Here in Rochester, there was such enthusiasm for that movement that we wanted to go down and be a part of the parade there. So Rochester decided to also have a parade, but to have it the following month. So I was at an event on Friday where Trillium Health was giving us this whole history, just a tiny bit of which I lift up to you. And someone remarked, and that's why we get two months of pride here in Rochester. And we, at Third Church, have been a part of that movement and have been a part of that movement within the Presbyterian Church USA. We even got a shout out at this event that I went to at Genesee Country Village and Museum on Friday for being a church that is affirming and welcoming to all people and particularly LGBTQIA plus persons. It made me so proud to be a part of that and then yesterday for us to be a part of the parade which in its new location almost doubled in size from 140 participants marching last year to over 240 marching this year. The time of discernment has moved into the time of building, and what has been and continues to be built is community, is a recognition that we together are the house of the Lord. This is what we see in our scripture lesson as well, because we've got a repeat performance. After Jesus feeds the 5,000, after he calms the water, once again, the disciples arrive at Genesaret. They come out where people recognize them, gnosis them. And then, wherever they go, whatever they see, people come to be a part of this movement. This movement that starts with discernment and builds toward miracles. This movement that starts with being one and then community and then a house of the Lord. And I think that is the point of both of these passages. This space, this place that we are so blessed to be in, that we are so blessed to be filled with the presence of God and then to be able to take out into the community is just part of what it is to be the house of the Lord. Jesus says, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, I am with you. Paul says that our bodies are God's temple. So it starts with each and every one of us, that we individually are a house for the Lord. And then that grows out into us as community, as a house for the Lord. And then we sit in a space like this that is also the house of the Lord. And we go out into the world just as Jesus does in our scripture, into nature, into even the wilderness spaces. And that is the house of the Lord. Know this. Know this, wherever you go, whatever you do, you are in and with the house of the Lord. Amen.